The Last Argument of Kings Battle Report. In this game, we're playing Spires versus the Old Dominion in the scenario Off Balance. So first up, here we have my Spires opponent. Uh, I'm not going to go through everything in the list in depth because this is Conquest and there are like character upgrades and there's a lot of customization and flexibility very briefly about the armies and you will find all of the detail for the armies in the description of the video. But in short, what we're doing here is um, we've not been playing Conquest for a huge amount of time, maybe like eight months at this point. We just about have 2,000 point fully painted armies, so we're doing a fully painted battle with almost no proxies. We've kind of allowed ourselves one proxy each, uh, and in this case the notable proxy in this list is this unit here. They may look like Vanguard clones, but I assure you they are Vanguard clone infiltrators, aka the most broken unit in the game. Otherwise, what my opponent has here is lots and lots of force-grown drones, which are not particularly good regiments. They are a necessary tax in this case, because they're what he owns that is mainstay, in order to fit other better, more dangerous things. So for example, we have the Vanguard clone infiltrators, we have some marksman clones here, a Theromancer in a unit of drones, a Biomancer, who is the Warlord in a unit of force-grown drones, um, a highborn lineage highborn in a unit of Avatara, unlocking Centaur Avatara, and then we have a big five-strong unit of Brute Drones and a unit of Incarnate Sentinels. This is a Directorate Army list, meaning that the Biomancer here is the Warlord, uh, which means that the Personalized Epigenetic Triggers rule is in effect, which gives, once per round, any regiment in the list burnout, which increases its speed, increases its clash, but does damage to it. Uh, the Biomancer Supremacy ability also doubles down on that, as do the Biomancer and the Ferromancer themselves. This is a list that has lots and lots of capacity to do lots of damage to itself, which is kind of bad, but what you get in exchange is huge offense, like tremendously lethal offense. Uh, Overall, there are many things in this list to be scared about. Uh, Incarnate Sentinels are quite scary. I am happy that it's not a five-strong unit, because it doesn't own five of them yet. Uh, brute Drones, I am hugely scared of. They have comfortably one-shot big units of Old Dominion stuff before. The Avatara are okay. You have to respect them, but they're not massive. But then otherwise, the overwhelming threat here is the Vanguard Clone Infiltrators. This is probably the best single unit in the game when there is a Biomancer behind it. Uh, they functionally break the entire curve of range damage math. They, they are also, with the uh, High Clone Executor in them, they are ex basically, they there are no natural counters to them. Uh, if you run into melee with them, firstly, they will always shoot you first. Um, shooting back at them is useless because they have loose formation. Casting spells back at them is useless because they have loose formation and a pocket healer. Uh, trying to just charge them with cavalry like a march charge is useless because they have loose formation. And if you engage them, they will just leave melee. They have good resolves. They will almost certainly pass their resolve check. And because they have fluid formation, they will just march away from you, shoot you out of their ass, and then reform and face you again. And the nightmare will continue. So it is, for practical purposes, impossible to effectively shut down Vanguard clone infiltrators. I don't have fast aura of death units in my list that would be something on paper that is quite good at it except that like say in old dominion what qualifies as fast aura of death units is maroi and when fully buffed that unit of vanguard clone infiltrators from 22 inches away or sorry 24 inches away will move towards me shoot me and kill four stands of maroi on average uh, with an unnamed shot with the biomancer's buffs so there is Effectively, no natural counter to the um, Vanguard Clone Infiltrators. They're just, they're just hugely, hugely dangerous right now. I am most scared of them. And accordingly, expecting them, I have made some adjustments to what would be a usual list for me to try and deal with them just by countering the damage as best I can. So let's have a look at my list. So this is my list, and again, the actual full list will be in the description in the video. Um, but this is an Old Dominion list, and what we have tried to do here is to make ourselves at least moderately resistant to the uh, deadly shot, huge quantity of deadly shot attacks that can come from um, the Vanguard clone infiltrators, and just generally from, from any Biomancer buffed unit. Uh, if Deadly Blades gets put onto the unit of Brute Drones, and they charge them downtown because they can get up to speed A very easily, um, I think even higher potentially, uh, that you're going to have a really bad time. So we have not relied at all on evasion in this list because evasion is you just want as high a saves as possible and you want untouchable. So what we've got here is we've got lots of legionnaires because it's ultra minion. Legionnaires are not very good. They are they are just kind of like crappy mainstay troops. They have very little offense. They are not very survivable, um, particularly with phalanx the way that it is right now. But 
they're really the only mainstay that we've got. Um, so I've got an Archimandrite in one unit, a Hero Deacon in another unit, and then a third unit, just to unlock some mainstays. I would have liked more. I've got one more standard Legionnaires I could have put in this list, but I didn't really have the points for it. Uh, the Hero Deacon has the usual Blasphemous Soma, and then plus one Arcane to make him into a reasonably competent blaster and to generate lots of dark power. And the Archimandrite is my Warlord, but doesn't really have much going on. He's got like 30 points of random equipment, would have realistically given him the Consecrated Mitre for 25 if I had needed to save 5 points. He's a utility caster. The reason he is my Warlord rather than either this Strategos or this Heliarch is that my combat groups don't really allow... Like, I could have the Strategos be the Warlord in this list, but it's not really kitted out to make a lot of use of it, although it would not be bad. Um, having his ability to reform gives a huge charge threat range to this Heliarch unit. Um, but really, what I would like to do is have a list with the Heliarch as the leader otherwise. But the Archimandrite is fine. You get a little bit of value every turn out of the extra spell cast. It's well and good. Uh, in the back, we've got two Brute units. We've got a unit of Caryatids, one of my favorite like uh, emergency response units. They will always do okay against everything. Um, they have very few truly bad matchups. And I like them a lot. So they were in this list. And we have Caryatids. Um... I am wary of putting too much support into the list, but with one Archimandrite, one Hero Deacon, and kind of like no other support, I feel really comfortable, reasonably comfortable including them. Then we have the Strategos' group. So the Strategos is part of the solution to, the hoped for solution to Vanguard clones. He is kitted out for absolute maximum defense. He's got the Scoffnung Sword, but he has Aventine Armor and Eternal Discipline, which gives this regiment tenacious and untouchable on top of their 4 plus saves. Which means that, and this is the really important thing, Untouchable lets you reroll failed defense rolls of 6, which means that Deadly Blades and Deadly Shot has a much, much lower chance of doing any damage to you. And you have to get very unlucky or suffer a truly prodigious number of hits for a 6 to get through both reroll your 6s and Tenacious to turn one dice into a success. Um, so this regiment is expensive, but it is very tough. And I'm basically setting them up to, to take a lot of Vanguard clone shots. Uh, we otherwise have a unit of Central Prodromoi. This is my one proxy. Uh, they are painted. Central Prodromoi don't exist yet. This is a unit of undead Roman cavalry with Legionnaire shields, but they are not a conquest model. Um, but I'm using them because I don't own any more Legionnaires to make into more mainstays. Because eventually Prodromoi will come out, and I like them a lot. And then finally down here we have a Hiliarch in a regiment of five... Praetorian Guard, and to continue the theme, he's kitted out for some blender ability. So with Gladiator and Calamitas, he's Clash 3, Cleave 2, Deadly Blades, Flurry, Parry, like, he won't beat the very best melee characters, he could be better if he had full-on combat regiment 3, but he is pretty dangerous. Um, and then he rounds out what he's taking with Regalia 1 and the banner that gives Untouchable to the regiment. So we've got two units here, both of them with Untouchable, which gives me a decent chance, right? There we've got just good, good saves on both, a huge wound count on the Praetorians. Um, we have the best chance I can put into the list. I, I will never... Like, it's just going to be really difficult to pin down the Vanguard clones. I'm going to have to get shot, but I have the best chance of not having whole units evaporate off the board when they look at me. So, let's see how it went. So, here's our setup for this scenario. Um, I will probably talk a little bit about um, Parabellum's scenario terrain rules, but just tonight we'll talk briefly through what we've got here. Um, so, we have two, uh, treat these as single terrain pieces, um, small forests that are obscuring, and then we have uh, forests over here that are obstructing. Normally I would use sort of physical obstacles to be obstructing. Um, that's technically speaking not directly in accordance with the rules in the scenario pack. The scenario pack tells you to use obstructing zonal terrain, I think. But it does say at minimum you should always include two obstructing terrain pieces and two obscuring terrain pieces. So we have three obstructing and two obscuring terrain pieces. And then we have some hindering pieces here. I actually much prefer to use uh, three-dimensional terrain for conquest whenever I can, but this was at a friend's place, and we had to bring terrain with us, and the majority of the terrain that he owns is for 40k. So, um, this is good old, you know, uh, age of, this is good old battlefield in a box kind of stuff. Um, this is actually terrain from Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, and then we otherwise have the, the scenario set up. So this scenario is off balance, and uh, deployment along the long table edges, but the setup is asymmetric, which I really, really like. So there are two 12-inch zones that are worth two points each turn, starting from the second turn and an extra two points if you're controlling both. Then there are four objectives, here, 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 and here. You are trying to destroy the ones on your opponent's side of the field. They are worth four points for destroying, but they're very hard to get to. 
Otherwise, the only way to score points in this game is to kill the enemy warlord. Some scenarios um, in Parabellum scenario pack give you points for killing enemy units, but not all of them. It's a it's a scenario by scenario thing. Uh, the only other thing to note is that um, we are choosing to use the tournament terrain guideline rules rather than the scenario pack terrain guideline rules. They are identical, except that in the tournament you can have in a tournament rather than in casual play you're allowed to have zonal terrain inside 12 inch objective zones. And I really like being able to do that. I think it lets you make better terrain pieces. Um, if we had chosen to follow the regular scenario pack rules, these 12 inch zones would have pushed terrain out this way and this terrain out this way. And there would have been even less terrain to uh, to break up, you know, break up lines of sight and maybe mitigate ranged attacks. So we've chosen to use the um, the rules from the tournament pack, not the rules from the scenario pack. Uh, I have asked why there is a distinction between the two, and the answer I got was a bit weird. Uh, they intentionally wanted to maintain a distinction so that there's a distinction between tournament and casual play. For my experience, I have literally never ever seen a game system successfully maintain two parallel rule sets and ask players to remember them both. Players will pick one. So uh, I really like being able to put terrain in zones, so that's what I'm doing. Now, this is obviously, this being Conquest, this is actually a picture at the beginning of the first round, but it will be easier for me to cut to the second round because then you will see the pieces that have turned up by the end of the first. So here we have the end of the first round slash beginning of the second, and unsurprisingly, with all of the light regiments in my opponent's list, lots of them have turned up. Um, I, like I said, I think before, four scrolling drones, uh, their small units are probably at their best in a directorate list, where you can tune up their offense a little bit with the burnout ability, and really properly use them as like fast gumming regiments. Um, and there are lots of small drone units in this list, which means there was always going to be a lot more stuff on the table um, from my opponent than there was from me. I actually won the roll on this turn, and I've elected to move the central progenoid up to here. And what they're trying to do here is they're trying to keep themselves safe. They, they were always going to come on before the Vanguard clones were, because tons of time was going to be safe. Like the Warlord was going to activate, the Biomance was going to activate, then drones were going to appear. I was never going to have the jump on the Vanguard clones. So I've moved them up on this side of the table, where there's a bit more obstructing, obscuring and obstructing terrain, and I've parked them as best I can in this obscuring terrain. When you're using terrain in Conquest, line of sight is usually drawn from the center of a stand to the center of a stand. So it's difficult to see here, but they've just got the center of their stand inside the obscure, obscuring terrain. So the only way to get a shot into this regiment that isn't obscured is to draw a line this direction uh, into the side of this stand. Now, that's not particularly difficult to do, which is why obscuring is a little tricky to actually make full use of. You really need maximum size obscuring terrain pieces. And even even then, these are maximum size obscuring terrain pieces. You're not actually allowed larger under the scenario pack. More kind of like interesting rules decisions, but that's okay. I do really like this game. I just think they're probably their weakest point is how they choose to handle terrain. Um, not helped, to be honest, by the fact that I'm not using 3D terrain. I really want some. I'm going to try and figure that one out. But so we've got our Prodromoy have moved up here and they've set the reinforcement line relatively far forward. And basically we have tons of drones walking onto the field and then the Vanguard clones have set up here. Now these Vanguard clones are projecting what is effectively an aura of unmitigatable death about 24 inches. Anything that walks about inside this area is going to get roasted. And my opponent has tons more activations than me, so if I walk into that zone I'm going to get completely freaking deleted because I guarantee you that the last like two things in the stack are going to be the Biomancer to boost the... Um, unit of Vanguard clones, and then the Vanguard clones to delete anything in that range. The reason why it's 24 inches, so they're speed 6 with a 14 inch range, but the Biomancer, what he will do is that he will stay within 8 inches of them, he will first give them deadly shot, and then he will use his second Biomancy, because he can use two, he's paid for that ability, he'll use his second Biomancy to give them, I don't know what it's called, but it's plus 2 march, plus 1 volley, plus 1 clash, volley is the important thing, and burnout. Um, which means that they have effectively 8 inches of speed. They will take damage after that. Um, usually they will take like 1 damage per stand. So he, he can expect to lose probably an entire stand on average dice to doing that. But then the Biomancer will just heal 3 back. Um, so they will slowly attrit doing that. Very, very slowly. But they do truly prodigious quantities of damage. Um, so that's how that's how things have looked at the end of the second end of the first round we've moved forward like this various different clashes have occurred but now i'm going to be able to start bringing things onto the table now the big challenge that i'm facing apart from the fact that there is this like 
radius of, of get fucked uh, in this space here is that this is a light unit, which means that it would not natively score, but because there is this medium character in it, they are going to walk onto this objective this turn, coming in round two, and there is nothing that I can do about that, which means they are going to start scoring. And they've also set the reinforcement line far enough up that something might come on here, which means that this is probably going to start scoring. So I am feeling really pressured here. Old Dominion kind of always feel this way. It is the nature of the beast. Old Dominion are a faction that flourishes on turns 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It's a 10 turn game. You always play to 10 turns in Conquest in the current scenario pack. I really like that rule, by the way. I love the heroic victory, or the, the uh, heroic end rule that they introduced in March. Um, you always play to 10 rounds, and you have to keep your eye on that prize. When you're playing Old Dominion, it will feel like you are behind early in the game. Now, it would feel like you were behind as almost any faction here, because, my god, look at all of this stuff. The game's barely begun. I have one unit on the field. But Old Dominion especially, you've got to maintain that degree of discipline. So... Let's jump forward and see how things look at the end of this round, beginning of next. So here's how the situation has changed, and we can see that things have begun to get kind of interesting. What has happened? Well, uh, as expected... <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I was unwilling to enter the aura of death range. Um, we've brought on... I had to think really hard about what's going to come on this turn. Uh, the auto pick, because uh, you get one unit for free every turn, that you don't have to roll for, was the Hero Deacon. The Hero Deacon has to turn up, and because the Hero Deacon... Like, because it's your Dark Power factory. I need to get this list to Dark Power Tier 2, Tier 3, to turn on Memories of Old, to start getting inspired in Clashes. Um, so it was always going to be the Hero Deacon, and I rolled two more successes. I thought a lot about what that was going to be, because I had like a genuine option to kind of just slow play this, um, maybe bring on some Legionnaires, just plebs, maybe run in that direction. Um, there were a few like options. I could have bought on the big Praetorian brick. Ultimately, what I decided was something was... I also could have completely abandoned this flank. I could have just run these, uh, run these cavalry in this direction. Ultimately, I decided the cavalry were there to get shot by the Vanguard clones, so let's set up for that to happen. I was never going to have as many activations as my opponent, because it was Spires, I hadn't thinned the herd yet. But we could get a little bit creative. So we brought on the Cavalry, and the Archimandrite as my second regiment. Bringing on the Archimandrite, let me do something that I would not usually do, which is accelerate your Dark Power growth by having... So that these Legionnaires walked forward, the Hero Deacon activated and used its draw event to kill a stand, and then summon some Dark Power. Then the Archimandrite moved on, and what the Archimandrite actually did was, firstly, it healed this stand back. Yay! But also, so back with two wounds, but still back. And also it gave plus, plus one tier of dark power to these uh, these Centaur. So, uh, whatever that spell is called, I forget. But anyway, made them count as having an extra tier of dark power, which meant that they actually had impact attacks. So my opponent did, like, you know, a bunch of stuff, kind of like, you know, bought some things on, etc. And I just... Once the Avatara had come on here, it was pretty obvious that, like, things were going to get a bit dire, but I had to make a push somewhere. And I could, I genuinely could have just kept the Prodromoi here, and what would have happened is that the clones would have eventually come forward, just engaged them, had a fight, and although bound clones not particularly good, 90 points of bound clones would have held back 150 points of Prodromoi, and I would have just been, I would have been fighting along this line for the entire game which meant that my opponent would have ticked up and ticked up and ticked up here, and I wanted to at least put him slightly on the back foot. So given that I could charge and get brutal impact attacks, I've marched and then charged, and we've killed six members of this bound clone regiment, which is like not very much and not a great trade, but it's not terrible. And we've then gotten shot because marksman clones have turned up and fired a volley into me and done five wounds. <laughs> but I... Typically speaking, and this is something Song of Ice and Fire has taught me, is I'm a little conservative. I don't like making charges that I might fail. I don't like extending units. I think that serves Old Dominion reasonably well, but sometimes you need to just seize a little bit of initiative. You need to make some openings. So I think this worked out reasonably well. Now again, I still have a lot less on the table. Look at all of this crap. Uh, the Vanguard clones are in position now. This is about 21 inches. So 21 inches is an important number because these guys have a maximum charge threat of 20, even if I wanted to reroll a bunch of sixes. Again, these models, these cavalry, these heavy shock cavalry with lots of brutal impact attacks uh, can't actually hurt Vanguard clones when they charge because the infiltrators have loose formation, which makes them immune to impact attacks. Um, very, very lovely ability that you get for free on the, uh, on the clone... High Clone Executor. But, so this is not, like, this is 
kind of a crap matchup, except for the fact that this unit is tough enough to not die. And that is like super, super important. So we're in an okay state here. We've moved things onto the table. Uh, I have done a little bit of damage. I've taken a little bit of damage. And my opponent is going to, as expected, score. So this is sort of like exactly six inches. This is about six inches. These are 12 inch zones. So my opponent is going to score four objective points uh, this turn. Which is fine, but it's a game of 10 turns. There are there are nine scoring turns in the game. My opponent has scored one of them. Let's have a look and see how things look at the end of turn three. So here we have the end of turn three, and I have had payoff for the opening that I gave myself with the Prodromoy. Uh, this Prodromoy has really gone quite deep. What happened here? Well, I won the roll. I had way fewer activations than my opponent, or my strategic stack was smaller, to be technical, which meant that I could modify the roll to see who goes first, and I won. And they activated, and with nine attacks, they just blew through that unit of bound clones that they were engaging, and then they made a charge into these marksman clones. Now, uh, they did no damage. They, they didn't hurt them at all because I did not have memories of old, so they had no brutal impact attacks, no, no impact attacks, but I tied them up. And then my opponent, who had those this Feromancer unit in play, had to try and charge to relieve them. And what did we say about bound clones? They suck. You want else sucks? Marksman clones in melee. So, okay, yeah, this guy is like badly wounded. He's got, I think he's he's broken and has taken a wound. There's only one left, but he is tying up all of this stuff with really no relief. Uh, he's going to die, but he has kept these marksman clones and this pheromancer back, and he's made me an opening that I am going to exploit next turn or this turn. Um, so we will see this in the next turn. But what is going to happen here? is that, um, so, we, so we, see, we see a wounded unit of bound clones here, that's because the Archimandrite went pew pew pew. Um, this turn, a few things are going to happen, but one of the main things you'll see when we skip forward in time is that the Archimandrite is going to move up to here, and he's going to blow them up. But we will get to that. Um, otherwise, what has gone on in the intervening turns? Well, I've moved these guys forward, and they've gotten shot a whole lot, and they've taken two wounds. That's really good, and this is what I hoped for, right? Like, the damage output from these guys is prodigious, but I have... Tenacious, Defense 4, Untouchable. I am in as good a position as you can possibly be to wither this fire. Like, literally nothing in the game, I think, except maybe... No, even even Defense 5 Stoneforged are not as good at resisting this, this kind of damage as as this, kind of, um, this uh, cavalry unit. So this is paying off. I actually got quite lucky with my rolls to only take two wounds. They're going to get blown out in short order. Um, the cavalry will survive the game, but like not by much. Uh, but they're taking these hits, and that is opening up the line for the Hiliarch to move forward here. The decision to bring the Hiliarch on the side of the table is also like kind of challenging, because this is my best combat unit, and I want it everywhere. But as before, right, these two regiments are the only ones that can stand a chance of getting shot at by these guys. So on they come. My opponent has countered by bringing his center avatar on this flank here, and bringing the um, the, the sentinels, um, the the big cleave two boys. Their name will come back to me um, on here. So this is this is smart, right? Because particularly these guys are the highest cleave in his army. They are a natural counter to these two units. These high defense units looking to reroll sixes into successes, just hit them with cleave two. Uh, likewise, we have brutal impact here. So these. With no reliance on Deadly Blades, uh, counter these units quite nicely, but it is the price that I've had to pay for putting units in front of the Vanguard clones infiltrators that don't immediately die. Like, yeah, this is... God, like almost a thousand points of stuff. Maybe not quite that much, but it's a lot. It's very close. To, it's, it's like more than, a th more than a third of my army to counter like about less than half of my opponents. Less than a quarter of my opponents, rather. But needs must, right? This unit is super strong. These guys coming on here is going to set them up for a clash here and here. I'm going to take a lot of casualties taking this fight. But it's in a position, at least, where I'm not getting just immediately deleted by these guys. And over here, things are going basically okay. I've moved uh, I've moved these guys on. They actually, they actually came in off the table edge, marched on, and then like shimmied sideways, which forced the Avatar to reform so that I wasn't in their rear, not in their line of sight. Now, my opponent's totally happy with this. He just wants to keep scoring the zone. I'm not in it yet. He is. If I'd marched all the way on, he would have just charged me and belted the crap out of me. Um, I've moved my Karyatids on here. They've taken some shots. They've done one wound. Not great, but that's fine. 
and I've moved my Canaphores up. Canaphores, as I mentioned, are my emergency response squad. They will do just fine in this fight. This is a bunch of cleave one attacks. They are defense three, hardened one, blessed. They will actually win this fight pretty comfortably eventually. I love them. They are an yeah, emergency response squad. They've come to fill a gap um, because I don't have anything else to do. So things are looking okay here. I've lost 100 points of stuff, plus, you know, wounds on this guy. I've killed 90 points of, of clones, plus a little bit extra. But that's that's okay. Like, these are the wounds on this regiment, by the way, because they burned out to try and make the charge. Um, I'm not hugely behind, and I'm slowly accumulating dark power. And this is a really good position that I got by pushing my luck. Let's jump forward to the next round, uh, round four, and see how things are going. So, as we can see here, over the course of turn three, uh, the, the field began to clear. Lots of stuff has died. So, uh, this flank here, we had the Prodromoy engaged by the Ferromancer. What has happened? Uh, the Prodromoy actually went first and took a little bit of a swing here. Um, some other stuff was going on, and then I moved the Arca... So, the Arca Bandrite, who was my Warlord, um, declared his supremacy at the beginning of the round, activated second, turned the tide, which lets the Legionnaires that he's in move forward, and gets him in range to fire a volley, into the Ferromancer, which kills the Ferromancer's regiment, uh, destroys them before they can activate, and the, the Centaur Prodromoy then immediately dies to a melee attack from the Bound Clones Marksman, but I think that looks like that's really good. The Ferromancer is one of the force multipliers. One of the things he can do, for example, is make the Bound Clone, uh, the clone Marksman shoot twice. Um, I just didn't want to have any of that. My opponent, for his part, has moved the Brute Drones forward and done a March Clash, and done a couple of wounds to this regiment, but he is, and then they got countercharged by these guys, who took, you know, a few wounds. What he is doing, and a Spellfire, so I, I did six wounds to the Brute Drone regiment, which is pretty nice, between the charge and the, um, uh, the spell from the Hero Deacon, who has just barely line of sight, technically. Uh, like, literally, it's corner to corner line of sight, so I'm not actually sure if that was legal in retrospect. May have, I may have needed to have reorganized this formation before I made that charge. That's on me. Remember, line of sight is drawn from point to point. Uh, middle to middle, not from corner to corner. Whoops. Um, you know, it happens. Uh, mayor culpa. Uh, I could have, I could easily have shot first and then, um, I had the order activation to shoot first and then charge. Should have just done that. That's okay. Um, maybe I did do that, actually. Anyway, so we've skinned the Brute Drones down a little bit, but if my opponent wins activation next turn, I'm going to kiss my Archimandrite goodbye, but it is the nature of things. Um, otherwise, the Vanguard clones teed up again, and remember I said before I only lost two wounds on these uh, on these guys? Yeah, they got lucky this time, and I got unlucky. Um, rather than only taking two wounds, I took uh, seven, I think, um, which broke the regiment, so I couldn't heal it, and... That's what, like, literally, okay, the, the most the most defensive unit in the entire game that I can think of against those Bound Clone Marksmen, and I took seven wounds. Uh, that will tell you a little bit about how dangerous Bound Clones are, particularly when they get even marginally lucky. But, is the nature of things, I'm not dead. I have gotten charged by some units of Bound Clones. I've given them a beating, but because of all the damage I took from the ranged attacks, they are not dead. That's basically okay. Over here... This is not a clash, right? Any The damage to this Bound Clone unit is because my opponent spiked some burnout on them um, and was not able to fully heal up another stand. But the Praetorians have basically just made a run for it. They've made a march and a charge, and the Hiliarch has declared a duel, and my opponent has just said, no, I don't care, I'm refusing that. We'll break, that's fine. Um, that does put some activation pressure on him next turn because he can't heal a broken regiment. But, I've tied them up at least. I've just had to take a lot of casualties to do it. I'm also in a horrific strategic position. Um, I got very lucky. These Incarnate Sentinels failed a charge. They needed like a four, but he'd went for it, because why not? Um, but he's closed the gap now uh, to, to about, I think that's about seven or eight inches. So they're very likely to charge. And he's moved the Centaur Avatara up to get comfortably in my flank. So this unit, although they have shoved forward and engaged the uh, Vanguard clones... They now have their natural counters staring at them in the flank. So that's pretty bad. On the other hand, things on the other flank are looking... Okay, so the Brute Drones are scary. They're going to delete something next turn. But they won't do it for free. The Marksman clones are freed up now. But we've had a back and forth here. The Carrioteers just keep whiffing their shots. So I've done, like, no damage to this Avatar. I think there's, like, two wounds, maybe three wounds on the Avatar here. But we're setting up, right? The Avatar are still bound up by the Legionnaires. 
and the Caryatids are in a really good position to take that fight and job them next turn. So, in this case, right, my opponent has scored for two consecutive turns. He's on eight points. We'll put him over here. But I have finally scored my zones because I've shoved onto this objective and that's six stands. I've shoved onto this objective and we've got, I mean, at least three from the can of horse plus these guys. So I'm now on four. The game is, the game has not turned. This strategic situation is very precarious. I am now taking a lot of damage, but the kill on the Ferromancer was really good. And my dark power is slowly ticking up. We're in dark power tier two now, and we're going to hit tier three relatively soon. We just need to take some more casualties, and we're going to. So, let's see what happens. So once again, the field has thinned, and yeah, we're missing some elements. What went down? Well, I won the supremacy roll, which was really, really good. Um, I could easily have lost that. I, I Unabashedly, I got very lucky. I actually think my opponent might have had fewer stands than fewer um, stacks than me at this point because he was beginning to finally bleed down drones because he'd lost he'd lost the um, Ferromancer and the drone regiment and a drone regiment like over here so he was down three cards and I was only down the cavalry the um, Prodromoy so I think he actually had an advantage on the roll but I won anyway which was which was really big because it meant that. The Hiliarx unit could activate, draw event Bastion, get up to defense four, and just annihilate the Vanguard clones. This is what fine this like they all I had to do was expose myself to a horrific amount of damage, and they broke it through. Now my opponent for his part has declared the Biomancer Supremacy ability, which is part of why there is nothing on the table right now. Um, we'll go through step by step what happened, but the thing about the Biomancer Supremacy ability is that it is one of those. One of those things that Spires, and especially the director, can do, where they have the most access to the burnout mechanic. And it's just souped up stacks with burnout. Um, it gives you more attacks, but what it does is it gives you a bonus, an offensive bonus, but you take decay. Decay is a number that you'll roll that you'll take, for every five and a six you roll on those dice, you'll take a wound to your stand, um, which can, can shred regiments, right? So the Biomancer Supremacy ability, Provoke Instability, puts, I think, like decay three or decay four, depending on the regiment, per stand. So Brutes, I think, up to Decay 4, which means you roll 4 dice, every 5 or a 6 does a wound to your regiment. You stack that with Burnout, and you're rolling like Decay 7, which is huge amounts of damage. Now, he did not choose to make that stack, but this is one of the things that this like, you need healing to keep up with this kind of damage. And it's often, it's not a good trade. In terms of points, right, in terms of what you lose to make those attacks, if you roll even a little bit unlucky on your, on your Burnout rolls, your regiments begin to literally dissolve into goo before your eyes, and the casualties that you take aren't commensurate to the extra damage that you deal. So, like, it's like three extra attacks per brute drone, but then you roll three, um, three or four uh, dice per brute drone stand, and you take that many casualties. Um, take casualties for five or six. The the trade is not actually great. But points are not the only thing that you are, they're not the only currency that you spend in this game, right? Yes, you've bought your army, yes, it's 2,000, 1,500 points, but that's not, that's not your only resource. Your other resource is your unit actions, and you're doing all of this in pursuit of your scenario points, because that's the only way to win the game. The game ends on turn 10, with whoever has more scenario points being the winner. All of this damage that spires can do for themselves, they do that in pursuit of efficiency of activation. So it might otherwise take, like, like, let's take this unit of four Brute Drones, right? So remember, I had my Archimandrite Regiment here, and the Brute Drones were engaging them kind of neatly. If they hadn't used Provoke Instability, then they're rolling 20 dice, hitting on threes with Flurry, so that's rerolls to hit, uh, which means that you hit, on average, 15 attacks. And 15 attacks is exactly enough damage if you are rolling perfectly averagely to wipe out that wounded Archimandrite unit. They had 10 wounds left, and they saved on ones and twos. But there are a lot of potential circumstances where you just get a little bit unlucky, or I make a little bit, I make slightly above average saves, and I'm alive with one wound. The decision to take those, to, to pop the Biomancers, provoke instability, take those extra attacks, and take those casualties, meant that the Archimandrites unit got destroyed, and it got destroyed before it could activate. So yes, I won the roll here, I broke this situation, I've charged forward into the Biomancers regiment, into the teeth of the freaking world, but I've paid for it with the life of my Warlord, which immediately scores my opponent two points. So at this point, the score is um, 10 for my opponent. That's 
really not visible, but 10 for my opponent, and it's now it's 4 for me. However, the Brute Drones take a bunch of damage. And the they get finished off by this regiment reforming this direction, getting everyone into line of sight, making an Inspired Clash, and it's an Inspired Clash now, because I'm in Dark Power Tier 3, because everything is dead, uh, and the Hero Deacon spell. So the Brute Drones go down. I've killed them off. Over here, the Avatara, uh, Marksman Drones, uh, Fire, they they don't quite kill the regiment attacking the Avatara. Um, the Legionnaires pinning them down, so the Avatara then have to activate and clash to clear it off, which means they take Burnout, and then they make a charge, and they actually whiff the charge into the Canophores. They don't, they actually take almost no wounds. The Brute Drones got jobbed by Burnout, the Avatara take very, very few, but they are wounded. I get another volley from the Carrier Tids, which does like, again, like, two wounds. Um... But the Canaphores charge. And because there's nothing left to shoot the Canaphores, they can use their Blessed for their Clash attack, and it just obliterates the Avatar. So they go down. This part of the board is now firmly in my control. On the left, what has happened is, yes, I've killed the Vanguard Clone Infiltrators. That's fantastic. I've charged into melee. The reason I did the charge was that the charge carried me out of line of sight of the Centaur Avatar. But it is a very good chance it was not the right call. Um, I think the, the actual call, so if you remember the regiment was like here... I think the actual call might have been to just back two and a half inches up, because they, they clash as their first action. If I back up, yes, I'm kind of abandoning the scenario zone, but I'm not getting flank charge. The Avatar, the Avatar would have been in my front. They would have potentially had to charge over this, um, this hindering terrain, like one of them might have, and then they'd get their charge attack. Their charge attack would have been very, very dangerous, but would have done some damage to them. But I can take a hit in the front, and I'm not getting hit in the flank by these uh, incarnates. Now, I decide to push my luck, knowing that the regiment might well die. Because if I win supremacy again next round, I'm in position to hit this Biomancer regiment. Now, what actually happens is I get in, I duel, the Biomancer declines, Biomancer rallies his unit, and then everything hits me. Uh, this unit attacks, the, these guys attack, and these guys attack. I get very lucky to not get wiped out. Now, the regiment has 25 wounds. It has Bastion active. It has good defense. It can't fail resolve checks. But the amount of force that went into this unit, Brutal Impact 2 in the flank, Impact hits, um, Cleave 2 in the side, everything under the Biomancer Supremacy effect, I got, I got lucky to have this regiment not be like maybe one stand left alive. They weren't going to shatter, right? Because they were... They were full health when the turn began. So to, to shatter the regiment, you would need to kill three and then two stands, which is the entire regiment anyway. So they were only going to shatter if they got completely wiped out. But to be alive on, what's that? I think uh, maybe eight wounds is fortunate. Um, it also meant that the, so the, incarn the incarnates, uh, these guys, they didn't make a clash, so they didn't take any uh, instability, but the Biomancer's unit did and got pretty badly beaten up. I think he may have also burned out for extra, uh, extra, extra uh, um, decay. But then these guys finally cleared off the drones that they were engaging and made the charge. And they haven't done a lot of damage, but they've done enough that these incarnate sentinels between uh, a charge, no clash, just a charge, because they had to clash to clear off the, um, the drones, uh, a charge and the burnout that they already suffered, this guy is now very badly wounded. This actually has a broken regimen because they've lost two stands this turn, which means that they can't be healed by the Biomancer. Well, the Biomancer would really struggle to heal these guys anyway because the Biomancer heals three wounds per activation. And with one wound on them, you can't overflow and heal a stand. Um, so at best, he would clear off this one wound. But the fact that they're broken means he can't even do this. So... I have gotten lucky with this situation being the way it is. If I'd been unlucky, they'd be dead. I wasn't unlucky. Instead, I was lucky, and they're alive, and I won the roll in the first instance. Uh, very easily, by the way, if I'd taken an extra round of attacks with Deadly Blades from the... Um, these guys, like, just, yeah, it, it would have been a mess. Um, my opponent did actually have the Brute Drones early in his stack, but I think he had the Vanguard clones earlier, because um, if they were dead, he wouldn't have to play them. So, this situation is dire. I am probably, probably not going to win here, but it's not looking bad. It's looking dire. And here, we've won this flank. These guys are not going to be able to fight this entire lot. I've got a couple of different options um, in terms of how I engage them, but what I would actually choose to do, we actually call it here, by the way, so I'm just kind of den denumoning the game. 
um, the, the cannibals are just going to run at them. They're running at them, they're going to push them back, they're going to engage them, they're going to eventually kill them, uh, and the caryatids are going to move up onto this objective and sit comfortably there the entire game, maybe making some shots, but they'll just sort of slowly move in this direction, scoring every turn. And these guys are going to make a run in this direction. They're going to destroy this, which they'll do quite easily with their clash attacks plus the spells from the hero deacon, which will net me four points plus this. So what really matters is what is going to go on in this point here. Now, I don't have a photo of this. But we basically played out the first couple of activations this turn. And what went down was thus. I won the roll and I killed the biomancer. No, sorry. I didn't win the roll, but my opponent activated the avatar and couldn't quite kill them. Uh, now, what he did here is he went for a clash so that he was, basically what he was hoping to do was he was hoping to clash this regiment, charge here, and finish these guys off. Now, this is not actually like, as plays go, I think it's the best one, but it is very much worth noting that this is still not necessarily a winning play because I've got characters in these regiments. And if I get wiped out, and the Hiliarch hasn't activated, he is 100% going to clash into this regiment of broken drones, and he will easily kill one drone, which kills the Biomancer. And if they uh, Centaur Avatar charge into here, and they kill, again, which they will probably do, they kill this last Cavalryman, this guy hasn't activated yet, and he will clash into the flank, and that's going to be six dice on fours, um, with Cleave 1 in the flank, with Terra 1, he will probably, and in fact we rolled that out, he would have killed this guy. Which means that the mutual annihilation that occurs here, even if my opponent succeeds with these Avatara, is that this unit dies, this unit dies, this unit dies, and this unit dies all in one activation. The Centaur Avatara are a very good unit. They're basically like just... Uh, sorry about that. Elite. They are effectively elite brute drones. They are tougher... I, I, they are about as tough for the points, they're about as dangerous for the points, but they're faster and have brutal impact, but they are a, no, not a mainstay regiment. But really all they can do at this point is chill out here. Um, on the very last turn of the game, basically they, they would be able to move slowly forward, occupy this position here, and potentially go for a Hail Mary and try and one-shot this, which they can do, right? They, um, they can do one damage, because they're a heavy regiment, they can do one damage on the Clash, and one damage on the and two damage, one, so one damage on the impact, two damage on the clash, but that's not going to be enough. I've equalized the score when I killed my opponent's warlord, so it's like 10 all at this point, and it's going to go 12, blah, blah, blah. Points will tick up. I will kill this regiment. I will kill this objective pretty easily, and my opponent is going to lose the game if he has to choose between scoring this and killing this. So the game is inevitably going to tick down, and that is assuming that I don't have a few turns, maybe shooting the carrier tits or something like that. Um, I am left with very little. The margin of victory is very low, but we have just, with some very good luck on this flank, squeaked out a win. So that's the game. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, I did say I would talk a little bit about terrain, and I just want to make the point basically that um, if you are playing Conquest Last Argument of Kings, uh, it's a lovely game. It's deep, it's crunchy, the list building is um, just super, like, I love to just, you know, chew on, chew on the lists that you can build in this game. Even with, like, factions are not complete right now, you can build some really, like, you can really flex and express yourselves. Um, the terrain rules need work. The decision of Parabellum to... Every terrain piece has to be 9 inches of every other terrain piece. That would make sense to say impassable terrain pieces can't be within 9 inches of each other. Um, but every terrain piece, it just forces the board hugely wide. Um, yes, okay, you want to be able to march a regiment through the gap. 9 inches is the ideal space to march a regiment. But this is zonal terrain. No regiment is obstructed in any movement on this table, and I'm still forced to put things 9 inches apart. That's really dumb. Um, it means that you can't do things like, you know, like you can't have a scene where you have like a farmhouse overlooking some fields near a river. That would be cool. That's probably slightly too dense, right? But like maybe we have like, you know, a babbling brook or something. We have some water, some obscuring terrain, some impassable. This is all super easy to move through. This is a small impassable terrain feature and it tells a story. You can't really do that right now. Um, you technically are allowed to have kind of like conjoined features, but their footprint can't exceed nine by six inches. You want to see nine by six inches? This is nine by six inches. You can just about fit a regiment inside a 9x6 terrain pace. Just about. Like, it's way too small. The table is massive. This is 6 foot by 4 foot. 
bigger terrain pieces, more terrain, more stuff going on. This is also particularly important because right now we've moved into the last time on the argument of King's version 2.0. And they made a bunch of changes to range units. I like the changes. They're less fiddly to use. Um, regiments now just have all of their dice at long range, um, and they get a bonus dice when they're at short range. It's way easy to calculate. It lets you use rules like effective range for different things. It's very cool, but it has ramped the range power of range damage in the game. And frankly, range was pretty powerful before the change. Yes, some units have lost uh, attack dice, but a lot of them, so some units have lost range rather, but very few of them have lost dice. And what it means is that a unit's lethal range is now, frankly, it's much further apart. So like if you think about marksman clones, for example, not necessarily the best example, but marksman clones used to be able to shoot like 24, 26, well, it was a long way. Um, but they were only really effective within half of that when they got their full dice. Now they have their full dice all the way out. Their maximum range is shorter, but they have their full dice all the way out to the maximum range, which means that, like, okay, this range here is now nothing, but this range here is way more lethal. So we've seen a significant increase in range lethality in the game, and terrain just does bugger all to stop the lethality of ranged. Um, in this terrain setup, I had more than the recommended amount, or more than the minimum, technically speaking, but I, I had I had just about as much obscuring and obstructing terrain as you could put on a table um, without like putting it in places like this and this and this where it would do nothing. Uh, I had it as close to the center, clustered along the center, and do you know the total impact across the entire game, the total impact of all of this terrain had on ranged attacks is that once, this unit of marksman clones suffered minus one to hit because they had to arcing fire rather than aim. That was the total effect of all of this terrain. Now it had strategic impacts, right? The infiltrators did not move up the side of the table. They moved up this side of the table and dominated all of this space instead. But a good player does not in any way struggle to get the lines of sight that they need with regiments, particularly at time of a time of recording. 17th of March, 2023. This is pre-recorded, by the way. This is going to go out uh, on in April um, for reasons. Uh, it's very easy to avoid obscuring terrain. There is not clarity around how obscuring terrain works. That's a separate discussion. Um, but yeah, so look, I, I, I am probably in future battle reports going to just kind of discard the March scenario pack terrain rules. I'm already doing that by playing the tournament terrain rules here, but I want more terrain. I want more interesting battlefields. I want more stuff going on. I want to use 3D terrain, and I will try and do that wherever possible. We just didn't have the opportunity tonight. Um, but yeah, I think I think honestly, like in terms of strengths of a game, Conquest has many. It is like there are two good rank and flank games in the market right now, and they are Song of Ice and Fire and Conquest. Song of Ice and Fire is the game that you play if you want a game that feels like a super tight, super slick, super smooth to play game. And Conquest is the game that you play if you remember very fondly the days of yore of, your, of Warhammer Fantasy. And you want to recapture that, but also it's 2023 and you cannot be stuffed playing with all of the shitty old sacred cow rules that existed in, in the oldest versions of um, Warhammer Fantasy. You want an actually modern game. You want a modern game that keeps you engaged at, like, at all times, that doesn't have you sit around for half an hour while your opponent does all of their turn, doesn't have the you know shooting phases, etc. Conquest is modern and it is slick, but it captures that like wonderful deep strategic essence, right? If, I was, if this is Song of Ice and Fire, we would never have had all of these things happen. This big flank battle here, this big flank battle here, the wheel around, the entrapment. Um, in Song of Ice and Fire, pieces are more floaty, they're more nimble. Regiments like function much more, much more cleanly, and you can like pull out and use tactical geometry a little more easily. Um, it feels like a wonderful game. This feels like a wonderful battle. Uh, I love both of them. I enjoy them both very much. But of of both games, I think for all of Conquest's strengths, um, comfortably its biggest weakness right now is that the terrain rules just don't let you do what you could do. They don't reach their potential. The actual rules for zonal terrain. For obscuring needs to be cleaned up, um, but like for for how terrain could work if there were just fewer restrictions on it, I think would be fantastic. Um, but we're not there yet. And you know what? 
here's the thing. I can just kind of ignore them. Um, in a tournament, okay, you know, we'll deal. I'll get shot off the table by a Dwegon army. I'll get shot off the table by Spires. Nature of the beast, I will run at them and die screaming. But uh, I can choose to do different things when I'm playing with my mates. And I probably will do that. Anyway, that's the end of this soapbox. Otherwise, I really enjoyed this game. I'm exhausted after playing it. Conquest is hugely mentally demanding at 2,000 points against a good opponent. And my opponent is a good opponent. Um, but... Uh, I am I am knackered, but it was it was great fun. Uh, really, luck carried me through this flank. If I had not gotten lucky here, all of these resources push in and they destroy me piecemeal, or at least they contest. I might have gotten very lucky, maybe, and taken out one of these, but my opponent would do the same. And because, really, what carried me through here was a bit of luck to kill his warlord at bare minimum. I think without that luck, he wins by two point margin. Uh, and I consider myself pretty fortunate to have come that close to victory. As it was, bit of luck pushed here, bit of luck pushed here, set me up very well, and that setup carried me through. Were these lists optimal? No, like I said, we're playing with like you know the the heavy cavalry, the medium cavalry. They suit the role that I wanted them to suit, but they are very expensive. Um, I've got lots of legionnaires here. I'd love sort of slightly different stuff, but nothing else is out yet as mainstay. Um, Canafors and Karyotids are fantastic. This was mostly a pretty good Dominion list. I would have maybe liked a slightly heavier presence. Um, but it was mostly pretty good. It's just four characters, right? Like, even in Old Dominion, four characters is a lot. For my opponent's part, kind of similar thing. The characters that he has are good, but four characters is a lot. Uh, Spires wants to condense that a little bit more. Maybe run fewer Force-Grown Drones in a list like this, in, a, in an Epigenetic Triggers list. Um, like, so for example, right, if this regiment the Ferromancer's regiment over here was bound clones, which he probably would have rather to have them been, uh, they would have easily killed. They're just more dangerous, right? They would easily have killed the cavalry. They would have freed this upper turn earlier. Yes, bound clones are more expensive, but they aren't that much more expensive. Um, and they are just bound clones, pound for pound, are just better. They they cost only 10 points more per stand than force grown drones. And for the cost, they are more res well more resilient, well more dangerous. Like they're they're... Yeah, there's just a... It, the difference is night and day. Um, there are light regiments in this game that are, like, fragile but dangerous, and then there are force-grown drones whose sole... Their sole, their sole virtue is that they're very, they're, they're kind of cheap, and they're not even really that cheap. They're good, they serve their purpose, they unlock more dangerous elite, like, non-mainstay regiments, but yeah. So there are definitely things my opponent would have done to tune this army up, and to be frank, you could have just taken more Vanguard clone infiltrators. That would also be an option. Anyway, hope you enjoy this, and I'll see you next time.